All right. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live virtual program presented by the Howell Carnegie District Library and the League of Women Voters of Livingston County. I'm Brandi Tambasco, Adult Services Librarian here at the library. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I have a few housekeeping items to share before we get started. Tonight's program is scheduled to run until 8 p.m. It will begin with a presentation by our speakers, followed by time for audience questions. To reduce distraction during our speaker's presentation, all attendees will be muted. You may share any questions for the presenter in the chat during that time, and they will be addressed after the presentation in the Q&A. Please address those questions to Howell Library Adult Services so that they'll get seen by the right person. During the Q&A, you'll be able to unmute yourself to ask a question if you'd like. We'll address as many audience questions as we can before the program ends. Throughout the program, please report any technical issues you may have in the chat. Subtitles have been enabled for this. Uh, here we go. Subtitles have been enabled for this program. If you want to turn these off, click the small arrow next to the live transcript in the bottom menu bar and select hide subtitles. This program is being recorded and the recording will be available on the library's YouTube channel and the League of Women Voters of Livingston County's YouTube channel soon after the live virtual program. If you do not want your video in the recording, please make sure your video stays off, that there is a red flash to the camera icon in the bottom left corner of your Zoom window. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to Ellen Lafferty, the chairperson of our local League of Women Voters of Livingston County. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, and I want to personally thank the Howell Carnegie Library and tonight's host, Brandy Tambasco, for making this virtual program available to us this, this evening. Uh, tonight, the League of Women Voters of Livingston County are pleased to host an educational evening on the voting process from the start to the finish. If you're unfamiliar with the work of the League, we are a nonpartisan organization that neither supports or opposes political parties or candidates. The League remains as one of the most trusted sources of nonpartisan election information for American voters. We encourage you to learn more about the League and perhaps consider joining us through our website, lwvlivingstonco.org. Before we begin, I'd like to encourage any qualified and registered voter who's listening this evening to consider applying to become an election inspector. Many of our own league members are hands-on trained election inspectors whose job it is to assist voters at the polls on election day. Information on where to apply to be an election inspector will be included in the follow-up survey email from the Howell Carnegie Library. In addition, many links to information that's shared from tonight's presentation will be included in that email. So hopefully you can relax and just take in all of this great information. And now I'd like to welcome our guests for the evening who are here to share everything you need to know about the voting process in Livingston County. First, we will have Livingston County's Deputy Clerk and Election Coordinator, Joseph Bridgman. Also, we'll have Brighton City Clerk, Tara Brown, and we also welcome the Livingston County Board of Canvassers Chairpersons, Judy Williams and Vice Chairperson, Carla Chapman. And now I'd like to turn it over to the experts. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Good evening. How's everybody doing? Um, so what we'll do is I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna start off with the PowerPoint. Okay, so start to finish the voting process. Um, what we're going to cover tonight is um, we're going to start the process. We're going to talk tonight about the voting process before election day, voting in the election, voting by absentee ballot, and then we're going to get into how do we get to election day. So what do we do before election day? What do we do during election day? And then what do we do after the election? And then I'm gonna share some resources with you. So this is what we're gonna talk about this evening 
Um, and I'm going to run through the voting process very quickly with each of you. And then we're going to get more in depth with um, how do we get to election day. Um, and I think that's really what most people are going to be interested in. So um, with that, the first thing you need to do before election day, everybody knows you should be registering to vote. Um, here on the screen is many ways uh, are the requirements to register to vote. Most of you on here, I'm sure, are already registered, but you need to get registered to vote first. Um, how can you register? There are so many ways to register to vote nowadays. There really is no excuse not to be registered to vote if you choose to. Um, you can register online at michigan.gov slash voter registration at any Secretary of State branch office. And actually, if you go to the Secretary of State's branch office and you do any transaction with a driver's license, you're automatically registered unless you choose not to be registered. Um, you can register at any of your city or township clerks or at the county clerks and many other places there. So that brings us into voting. Voting in the election. Um, there are two types of way, two types ways, if you will, to vote in the election. First is in person at the polling location. The second is absentee voting. Uh, Livingston County here has um, increased the absentee voting immensely over the last several elections, um, and which is a good thing. Um, so how do you vote in person? Let's talk about that first. So the steps to voting in person is you have to go to your polling location. Your voter ID card that comes from your local clerk will tell you where your voting location is. And what you do is the first thing you do is you fill out an application to vote, like here on the screen. Name, address, date of birth, and signature. Then we look at your voter identification. Uh, there's a list of voter identifications that are here listed. Um, and I want to make sure that you understand, yes, Michigan does require a voter ID. However, if you're not in possession of your photo ID at, at the polls, you can sign an affidavit. But you are required to show photo ID if, you have, if you're in possession of that. Once you do that, then what we do is after we verify your identification, we bring you up into what we refer to as the electronic poll book or the poll book. As you can see here, here's a name that is shown, and then we issue you a ballot. Once we issue that ballot, every ballot has a numbered stub on it. That number stub identifies that ballot to you until it is fed into the tabulator. So that ballot stub stays on while you're voting. Then when you go to the voting station, you cash, you mark your ballot after the voting station, then you go to the tabulator. At that stage, there is an inspector there that will take your stub off and then you feed your ballot into the tabulator. And that is um, basic voting 101 in uh, the uh, precincts. And then also, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this, is that if you go to the polling location, we have voter assisted terminals or what we refer to as a VAT, which is uh, a device for the disabilities community. However, this device can be used by anyone. Um, this device is a marking tool. So what this does is on a touch screen um, or the device uh, can any disabilities device can be plugged into this device to be used. And what it does is the it will select your uh, votes as you select them on the touch screen. And then at the end, you have an option to view those votes and then you actually print a ballot. As you can see here in the picture, picture there is a printer. So the ballot actually prints. Um, and this is for, um, Again, this is our disabilities device that we use, but anyone can use this process. That brings us to voting in the absent, uh, voting by absent ballot. One thing I wanna make sure that um, everyone kind of gets mixed up with what is absentee voting versus early voting. Absentee voting is what we have in Michigan, which is 
obtaining a ballot, voting the ballot, and returning that ballot in an envelope to your local clerk. Early voting, which we do not have in Michigan currently, is where you go to a voting location. It could be potentially your city or township clerk's office, and you actually cast a ballot and you put it into the tabulator and you do this prior to election day. So we do not have early voting in Michigan at this point. It is again, absentee voting. So what is the process for absentee voting? Most, most of you on this probably already know this, this is kind of redundant, but I'm going to cover it briefly. And Tara, if you have any uh, comments or, question, or, or suggestions, by all means, jump in. But the uh, absentee voting process is very simple. You have to get um, an application. So you have to request an absentee ballot in writing from the clerk, city or township clerk. Um, and you can see here are different uh, examples of a particular application. Voters that are already on our permanent absent voter application list typically gets mailed an application similar to this one at the top here, or maybe the second one here from your local clerk. The applications must be signed, and then you can return those applications by hand, mail, you can fax them in, you can email them in. Um, and if you come into the clerk's office, make sure you bring your photo ID because if you get uh, an application or a ballot at the uh, clerk's office, you will need to show your ID. There is something uh, that was just started in the last year or so was accessible electronic voter applications for those individuals that are blind and that um, have other severe disabilities. So again, this is another method to get an absentee a ballot application. So how do we get there? So what I covered real quick in that first 10 minutes was the voting process, basically A to Z, right? Um, but what people don't really understand is what is involved and in how do we get to that point of, you know, you showing up on election day and everything is ready to go for you. And how do we process AV ballots uh, before and after the election? And that's really what we want to spend time on so you can be absolutely sure that we run uh, elections securely and accurately and effectively here in Livingston County. So um, before election day, um, absentee voting, um, your absentee applications are used to ensure the identity that um, is requesting that particular ballot. So your application that comes in, we verify that by looking at the information that's on there, plus looking at and verifying your signature that is stored into the qualified voter file. One of the other things is absentee voting. We get asked this every township and city clerk and the county, we get asked this all the time. Well, I've already gotten an application. Why am I getting these other applications? One of the things is the city and clerks, townships, city and township clerks mail out official applications. However, political groups, interest groups, candidates, and even individuals are allowed by, under Michigan law to send out an, an absentee ballot application to you folks. So you will see a lot of times that you will get the official application from the city or township clerk and then one of the parties may send you out an application. So look at the return address on those applications. If that return address is not that city or township where you live, that is being mailed by a different organization, okay? What happens also if you get an application and no one, that person isn't there any longer? Um, our qualified voter file is updated regularly. However, um, it is only as good as the individual that is reporting the information. And what I mean by that is when you move out of your old house and you move into a new house, if you don't let your city or township clerk know that or go to the secretary of state and change your address, 
your registered address is the same as what's on your driver's license. So if your address is still at your old address, that's the address we have as your registered address. So therefore, that is sometimes why you get applications from individuals that have moved out of that address, you know, years, they just have not taken the responsibility to change their address. What's the status of my AV absent? And excuse me for my uh, shorts uh, acronyms here. Um, absentee voting is we refer to as AVs all the time. So AV ballots or AV applications uh, stands for absent voter. Um, so what happens to my application uh, or the ballots? Uh, you can go to michigan.gov slash vote. You can find out if you're registered, you can find out your application status, you can find out all sorts of things. What is the deadline for absentee ballots? Absentee ballots must be received by the clerk um, by 8 p.m. on election day in order to be counted. Um, what happens to my absentee ballot after I turn it in? Um, once you turn in your absentee ballot, the clerk will then process it. Processing that is that the application uh, or the ballot is matched with your application to make sure the signature matches. The, app, the signature on the ballot is also matched with a qualified voter file. Um, and it's scanned into the qualified voter file. So we know that we sent you an application. We know that we sent you a ballot and we know when we received the application and we know when we received your ballot. Um, and then your ballot is secured in a secure location um, in the clerk's office. Your Can I just add, add in here, Joe? Um, if you were to call the clerk's office and, and ask about your ballot as well, we know exactly how many ballots are there that day. So it, we have a running total. It's in our qualified voter files. As Joe indicated, the QVF, we have a running total of those. I know exactly how many ballots have been checked in that day, how many are in total. And that goes for everybody. Everybody knows how many because we scan them in every day. And, and during very busy elections, we scan them in multiple times a day. So it's not just um, we, we put them in a, a folder and there they go. No, we know exactly how many ballots are there. We know who's turned them in and we know how many are still outstanding. So we can give you those details. And, and that's important to know because uh, during the larger elections, we do see a lot of questions and, and field a lot of questions from folks on wanting to know, um, how do I know my ballots in there? How do I know? I, I can show you exactly how many, and, and most clerks would be happy to, to show you exactly the process and, and show you how, how detailed we are with the numbers exactly. Sorry. Exactly. Thanks, Tara. No, absolutely. Um, and then that kind of brings us to um, the ballots. How are the ballots created? So this is all um, the application process is all prior to the election. Um, and you're going to get your application probably a month or two months prior to um, you actually getting your ballot. Um, and while you're, while everyone is, is getting their application back to the local clerks, we're busy printing ballots and making sure that the ballots are ready to go um, when they are due to be mailed out. So how are they created? Um, the design uh, and the style of the ballot is created uh, on a special computer in the county clerk's office that is not connected to the internet is not connected to any network or any of that. Um, our particular here in Livingston County is uh, vendor is Heart InterCivic is our provider. Um, that's the voting machines that you vote on. The equipment is certified um, by federally and at the state level. Um, and then once the layout of the ballot is put together and programmed, then the ballots are sent to a verified printer and they print the ballots and then they uh, ship those ballots out to the local clerks. Um, and a lot of questions, a lot of folks ask, well, why is the ballot arranged the way it is? Um, we have in Michigan what they refer to as ballot standards and also 
ballot standards are taken from Michigan compiled law or Michigan, um, uh, you know, election law. And that's where we have to lay the ballot out a specific way. Um, party order is based on the greatest number of votes received for the office of secretary of state. So um, I noticed uh, in, um, in 2020, uh, we had some questions of why all of a sudden did the Democratic Party, uh, was it listed first on the ballot and then the Republican Party listed second because for years it was Republican and Democratic. And this is why that the ballot is um, laid out the way it is because it's based on the number of votes received for the office of secretary of state. And in 2019 began that year that um, Jocelyn Benson, secretary of state is of the democratic party. So that party became listed first. Um, another question, there is no difference between an absentee ballot that you get in the mail and the ones that are at the precincts. They are identical precinct by precinct. Tabulation equipment. Now, uh, we call it a tabulator. Um, we also call it, uh, a, uh, this machine down here is referred to as a VAT on the bottom, which is our voter to assisted terminal. But these pro these machines are programmed by the same computer that print, prints the ballots out. And again, this computer is not connected in any way to an internet or a network. It is a standalone machine that is used to program. Each tabulator has to be tested publicly with a logic and accuracy testing. Every one of our township and city clerks test every single machine that is used on election day um, with this public logic and accuracy test. Um, that is uh, a test that uh, they test every single piece of equipment and then one device is then tested and these public accuracy tests, and that's why they're called public accuracy tests, are open to the public. Um, for you to view and to make sure that it is being tested and correctly. Um, then after it is tested, then the program is sealed into that device. So the program is sealed from the time the testing until election day under a seal and lock and key um, so that there is no one that has been or have access to that machine. Um, on election day, the election inspectors verify that that seal number is the correct seal number that was sealed by that township or city clerk. Um, and then just here's a little uh, screenshot of the testing procedure manual and a list of all the different things that we have to test. And uh, I'm sure Tara can uh, speak to um, this test is not a very simple test. It is very um, in depth and it goes through a lot of different uh, mechanisms to test our equipment. So Tara, do you have any comments? You know, it's super fun for us that love elections. Uh, I, during the presidential elections and the gubernatorial elections, those are the larger ones. And uh, the test decks that I have to print out, I print out on a 20 by uh, 60 inch paper. And it has all the different variables on how a person could vote and also how a person could vote that would um, not count votes. So it has to test everything. It has to test all scenarios. It even has to test stray marks, blank ballots, because those do happen to uh, some people do cast blank ballots. Um, we have to make sure that maybe if you spilled some coffee on there, it wouldn't register um, on those absentee ballots. So it's super fun. And, and I love showing it off because it's so detailed and it, it is so interesting how, how um, we test these. And sometimes during presidential elections, we have up to maybe 60 to 80 test ballots for each precinct. And uh, just for example, the, the last uh, city election, I only needed uh, 11 ballots. And going all the way up to a presidential, which could take about 60 to 80 ballots to test all the scenarios. And it's just based on 
how many candidates there are in each position and how many positions are open for voting. But it's it's very interesting. And and uh, if anybody wants to stop by, I'd love to show you. But it is it's super cool. There's even companies that come out and are able to um, help you with those help us with those. But um, some of us choose to do it ourselves. It's just based on uh, choice. Right. Absolutely. Um, so can a voting machine switch votes? And the absolute answer is no. Um, there are so many steps in place to ensure that machine cannot be tampered with on election day. Um, there are these testing that we do. Uh, every single machine is tested. Then the clerk seals these machines and then these machines are locked in a secure location. Um, and on election day, the election inspectors verify those that, that information. Um, and then after the election, the county board of canvassers and the post election audits ensure that the machines voted these uh, ballots correctly. So the other thing that to mention is that these machines are in your polling locations, but they are not just out there and by themselves. One of the responsibilities of election inspector is to keep watch over that tabulator to ensure no one has access to it. The only people that should have access to that voting machine on election day are election inspectors and voters feeding in the, the, their ballot into the, to, to the tabulator. So there is just no way that um, these machines can switch votes. And that brings us a little bit to a little political plug here, here is that election inspectors, what are they? We call them election inspectors. They're basically poll workers um, that work their elections. One of the things is I wanna remind everybody, election inspectors are our neighbors, our friends, um, these are individuals that are coming out that believe in this process. Um, yes, they do receive compensation from our city and township uh, townships, but um, it's not going to give them a retirement, if you will. Um, so um, just remember that when you're coming out to the polls or um, these individuals are doing the job that um, they only do two to, tw two to three times a year. And um, they're still learning also. They are trained. Um, they do have to go through a two year certification process, which is every two years, which is, happens to be this year. They have to actually listen to me for two to three hours to go through a lot of training to make sure that they're uh, ready to go for um, our August and November election. Um, we also um, can hire 16 and 17 year olds to work the polls. Um, most individuals don't always remember that, but 16 and 17 year olds that would be willing to come out and, and help us, um, they uh, are able to come out and, and work also. So how do I become? I'm glad you asked that. Um, so just so you know, um, here is a uh, link, livegov.com slash election inspectors. Um, this will be in the PowerPoint presentation uh, and you'll be able to click right on that. It'll take you right to that page um, to be able to uh, download an application. Um, the application would, should then be submitted to your city or township clerk that you want to work at. Um, and they're always looking for good election inspectors. All right. That's what we do to get ready for the election. Plus, there's several other things, but that's just a snapshot. Um, what about during the election? So what happens to my absentee ballot on election day, right? So, um, you know, Tara has sent out you the application. The application has come back. Then she mailed you out the ballot. The ballot has then, you voted the ballot at home, and the ballot comes back to us. She checks that ballot in. Um, she puts it in a secure room until election day. Um, on election day, um, in the morning, she delivers that to her absent voter counting board. Um, an ABCB is what we refer to those. We love acronyms, right? Absent voter counting boards. Um, 
And that absent voter counting board cannot start processing those AV ballots until 7 a.m. on election day. So they get delivered. Um, and then the election inspectors are the ones that verify that the individual did return that particular ballot. And then they start opening those envelopes. There is a whole process for opening those envelopes. The process is that they open the envelope and they pull the ballot out of the envelope, put the envelope. So the name of that person is uh, on, a, uh, on a different stack. They pull those uh, ballots out in a, and put those in a stack. That ballot should still be enclosed in the secrecy folder that you return. Um, once they do that, they put those in a stack. Then they go back and they remove all of those stubs off of those ballots before they pull them out of that secrecy envelope. And there is important because the secrecy of your ballot is what is utmost in an AV counting board. And then the ballots are put in a stack and then they are tabulated in a tabulator. And um, as um, Tara could uh, absolutely agree with here, every absentee ballot that comes back um, is processed and is tabulated on election day. So absolutely, it's not, it, go ahead. When, when, as I was saying before, when we scan them in, as they come in all day, every day before the elections, we know how many are there. So then we go and bring that total over to the absent voter counting board. And those totals, I say, we have 800 ballots that I'm bringing you. They count them up. Yes, 800 ballots. So we have to match. And, and if we don't, we have to go back and find out why, but we, we always have to match um, because, you know, we, we counted those in, they should have the same amount of number, the same number that we're giving them. And we, if they go through the, in the process, the absent voter counting process is to, to open those ballots is very much to ensure that there's secrecy from the time that they're open till the time they're processed the first person that opened them doesn't know how that person voted and it's all done for secrecy and to ensure secrecy of the ballot. Absolutely. How do you know that your vote won't be tampered with or changed? And as Tara just alluded to, that is um, done through the AV counting board and through the secrecy of that envelope. Um, and we've kind of covered that, so we'll go on. The AV counting boards are open to challengers uh, also. So challengers and watchers, poll watchers, may attend the AV counting board. However, they are sequestered just like the AV counting board individuals are until the polls close. So keep that in mind. Um, can an AV ballot be run through the tabulator multiple times? Um, our AV ballots are processed by teams of election inspectors. These teams ensure that only tabulated ballots are tabulated once, okay? Also then that brings in the board of canvassers and they verify that the numbers match as Tara alluded to earlier too. So it is a double, triple check, if you will. Um, what prevents someone uh, from voting in person and on election day by absentee. Um, and one of the things is that we talked about earlier was the qualified voter file or the QVF. So as your ballot is tracked in the qualified voter file, we know that you received your ballot and we, you received it, you voted it, and now you've returned it to the clerk's office. That is in the database. So if you go to the polling location, then it will show in our electronic poll book that you have already voted an absentee ballot. Now, there are other situations where uh, if you voted, if you got your absentee ballot and you decide you don't want to vote that absentee, you wanna go in person, you can take your absentee ballot to the polls and surrender that absentee ballot to the election inspectors at the polls and then vote in the election. But you must surrender your absentee ballot to them, okay? Um, 
What about deceased relatives or friends? Um, this is, was actually one of the questions that was provided to us earlier. Local clerks are, and the state regularly updates the voter list uh, from local, state, and federal data. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this data is only as good as what is reported by the individuals. One of the requirements that we have at, at the county level is we are required to notify every month all of those individuals that were deceased in Livingston County, we have to notify every city and local clerk of those deceased voters. And then they actually go in and cancel their voter registration in the qualified voter file. Um, why do we use paper ballots? Anybody can guess why we use paper ballots? Biggest reason is for accuracy of the election and also to have a paper record. Tara, do you have something? Oh, no, nothing to okay. add, sorry. Um, also, how do you know it's correct, it, it tabulated correctly? Um, this goes back to our testing. Our testing has, um, we have tested every single machine with a predetermined um, results. So we know if those ballots are being marked correctly. So when you mark your ballot, it reads what you mark. So when you mark that, uh, fill in that rectangle, that's what the tabulator is reading, that rectangle that is filled in. That brings us to after the election. So what happens after the election? Um, so you voted, you turn in your absentee ballot. Um, on election day, um, at the polls, all polls close at 8 p.m. Um, hopefully we have all the absentee ballots processed shortly after 8 p.m. in our AV counting boards. Um, but anyone on election day that's still in line still has a chance to vote if they're in the polling location. After 8 p.m., the polls, the chairperson announced that the polls are closed. Um, after everyone has voted, they close the polls on the tabulator. When they close the polls, it immediately starts printing this totals tape that you see here as an example. So it immediately starts printing that before it does anything else. Once it prints that first totals tape or that results tape, then it transmits the results to the county. Um, and then the county then accumulates all of the results from all of our precincts. And then we put that out as um, the uh, election, unofficial election results. Okay. The other thing is, is once everything is transmitted, um, the election inspectors do their paperwork, they seal every ballot that was delivered to the precinct, seal that into an approved ballot container, and then deliver that to the local clerk. Here is a, just a screenshot of the election night results, for example. Election night results are always, 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 always unofficial until after the board of canvassers do their work. So everything that you see on the county website um, prior to the board of canvassers convening and doing their job are always, always um, unofficial. These are just some more examples of what happens on election night. The other thing is, is um, election results come in sporadically. They do not come in all at one time. So you will see from time to time that, you know, four or five precincts or 10 or 15 precincts are reporting and we try to get those results out there. Um, but the results become official after the board of canvassers do their work. And with that, I am going to turn this over and I'm sure you're tired of listening to me. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over to our uh, County Board of Canvassers and we're gonna turn this over to Carla and turn this over to Judy. Judy is our chairperson and Carla is our co-chairperson. 
So you got to come on in. Okay. Let's see. Where are so here she comes. <laughs> I'm, okay, I'm in now. I'm in. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, the Board of Canvassers are an independent board made up of two Democrats and two Republicans. Uh, we all serve a four year term. Uh, Carla is our vice chair and she represents the Republican Party. And then we have Joan Runyon, who is also for the Republican Party. And then Nancy Savage is the Democrat along with myself. Now we are selected by the County Board of Commissioners. And everything we do is dictated by Michigan law. Uh, we have to go by the Open Meetings Act. All of our meetings are posted and open to the public. So anytime you want to watch us work, just come on down and watch what we do. We have several responsibilities. And the main one, of course, is to canvas and certify the election results. Uh, if ballots need to be retabulated because there's some question that we have about things, um, we're in charge. Uh, we process the provisional ballots if they're verified by the uh, clerks. Also, after the election, we are the only ones who can authorize opening up a ballot container. So when that happens, we supervise while uh, someone from that township or village or whatever, while we watch the, while they cut off the tag that sealed the ballot box and we verify the numbers. And then we watch everything they do as they remove the ballots to do whatever we're asking them to count or uh, whatever the case may be. And then at the end of the process, we watch while they stack them back in that container and put a new seal on. And then we watch as they write that new number in the poll book. So we are in charge of watching all of that. We also conduct recounts. So if a recount is called for, we're there watching every step of the way. And last, we have to go and approve the ballot containers. The state of Michigan gives us a list of what's approved for the state. And we go out and check every single one. And that happens on years that there's a gubernatorial election. So we're going to be doing that in April for this county. And it's going to take us five days to get through all of the containers. And the state of Michigan provides the seals that we must put on everything. If somebody gets a new container in between uh, when we certify, uh, we have a special meeting and we go through the same steps again. Now we have quite a bit of authority when it comes to the elections. If when we go through the poll books, when we're doing a campus and there, we have questions, we are able to tell the clerk to come in and to bring the election inspectors along with them. Okay, once we get in here, we tell them what information we want them to bring with them. Do we want them to bring all the ballots? Do we want applications that were sent out uh, on the AVs? Do we want envelopes that the AVs were uh, in? So we, any record that has to do with elections we can request. And we also have the right to, uh, when we go through the poll book, we can make changes in red if there's some little clerical error. Uh, they didn't check off that they um, had put a seal on the uh, container, but yet we see that they have the seal number. So we know they did it. So we might just put a red check in there and not call them back yet. Our goal is to make sure that our election has integrity so that everyone knows that what was voted is what is being recorded. Okay, we go for accuracy. We check all the numbers and we want to make sure that everything is recountable, that uh, we could run the same election with those ballots again and all the numbers are gonna come up the same. 
Okay, uh, next up is going to be Carla, our vice chair, and she has over 20 years of experience on the board of canvassers. And she's going to explain to you how we conduct the canvas. After you hear her, you can decide if you want to come and watch us work or not. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, all okay, right. Carla. Well, thank you, Judy. Um, as, as has been stated, the Board of Canvassers has two main tasks, and we canvass and we certify the results of the election. And so my job is to give you like a brief overview of how we run our actual canvas. We meet after the election, obviously, probably um, we can start as early as uh, Wednesday after the election at one o'clock, but we must start by nine o'clock on Thursday morning. And there are four of us, we meet in the historic courtroom of the courthouse here. And um, we break into two teams. Um, there are four of us, as Judy stated, and we break into teams of two and it's always bipartisan. Things that you have heard within this presentation tonight, um, there has been this emphasis on uh, security and checks and balances and re-reviews and examination. And that is just, it just runs straight through this whole process. And it actually culminates at the County Board of Canvassers meeting because we take what everybody has done and we kind of make sense of it and tie it up you know, with a bow and give you the results of it. So you want to know what we look at. We break, well, first of all, we break into the two teams, um, Democrat and Republican, Democrat and Republican. And we are presented with um, information, our documentation from the election. And it comes to us in envelopes that are sealed and one envelope goes to the, uh, this one goes to the county clerk, and this one goes to the board of canvassers. And contained inside, we have duplicate information. Um, there are pages from the poll book, there are duplicate totals tapes, there's just um, whatever information is in here is in here. And the teams, each, each team gets these two and we uh, pass it out and one canvasser looks at this and the other canvasser looks at that and we're double checking to make sure that all of that is the same. So that's another uh, little piece of security that's in the process. Um, our very first task is uh, a very lengthy task and it's not particularly exciting, but it's, so, it's the bedrock of our whole canvas. And that's where we take what um, has been transmitted to the county on election night, the totals that have been transmitted to the county on election night. And we have a printout of those. And then we also have a printout of what is called the V drive read in. And what happens is the local clerk actually goes to that tabulator and takes out the V drive, which is, is the brain of the whole thing, right? And um, and it's in a sealed container and it gets delivered to the county clerk who then reloads it into another database and produces a printout. And we compare them side by side. We read every single number that is on the page. And this report consists of many many pages. We've had Board of Canvassers that um, have lost their voices as we've read this thing, because it does take a little while. But once we complete it, and we know that it's all accurate, then we know that all the numbers, we have our baseline, we know that our numbers are valid, and we can work from there. If we have to, if we have to add, subtract, multiply, divide, whatever, we know we know what we're going to have to do. So that's when we start to take a look at the individual precincts. So one team will take, we all work on the same municipality, but different precincts. So one team will look at precinct one, the other team will look at precinct two, on, on and on. And if we um, run into questions, then the four of us will get together and we'll talk 
the question through to see what kind of action we might need to take. But really, the, the team is responsible for going through the poll book. And the poll book, you see it on the, um, on the presentation, but here is an actual sample of a poll book. And this is what your election inspectors use throughout the day to record everything that happens. So oaths are in this poll book, checklists are in this poll book, the poll list of voters is in this poll book. Um, remarks and numbers, seal numbers, oh, seal numbers are so important. Everything is recorded in this poll book. And the goal, the goal, what we're looking for actually is really simple. We need to have the number of voters in this poll book, the same as the number of voted ballots on the tabulator tape, as, and the same as the number of actual paper ballots that we count, that the election inspectors count, the voted ballots. If those all match, we're, that's wonderful. And we say that that precinct is in balance. And that's what we're going for. But like I said, we, we check this page by page by page. And um, as we're checking it, we have, um, we, it's our little working paper and it's a checklist. And it verifies that we have um, checked every single page and every single line and what our numbers were for that precinct. And this checklist is so important. It has two purposes. One is to keep the Board of Canvassers on track. Because, and the other purpose is we make a copy of this available to the local clerk so that they can look and see what happened in their precincts on election day and how their election workers processed everything. And it's a tool for them uh, for in, you know, continued improvement. It, let them know where they stand in continued improvement. We have so many precincts in Livingston County. We look at, um, let's see, it's 81, 81 precincts, 27 split precincts, and um, what was that third number? Um, yeah. Uh, 31. Yeah, and, and interestingly, 38% of the voters voted in the precinct and 62% of the voters voted absentee in the November 2020 election. So you can see that those absentee counting boards are, are so important. It's 60, you know, 60, 40, basically. It's, it's just fascinating to me. So um, we examined our totals tape. We examined the numbers associated with the candidates and with the proposal races, all the questions. We check all the write-ins and determine the validity. You know, so please be assured that you know, Donald Duck or Mickey Mouse don't get write-in vote. They they try, <laughs> they try to get their name on it, but they can't, they're not valid write-ins. And so we actually determine the write-in votes validity. We verify the seal numbers of uh, the security. Um, thread that runs through this whole election process shows up in the number of seals that election workers deal with in a night. And um, there are seals, you know, everywhere on envelopes, on, on um, ballot boxes, on that tabulator, the B drive. So they have to make sure that all of those are noted in the whole book. Like uh, Judy indicated, a lot of times our precincts are very, very, very clean. But every now and then we run into a question um, and we may need more information. It may be as simple as calling the uh, precinct chairperson and asking them a question about how they handled a particular duplicate ballot, for instance. Um, that leads us to be able to track down our answer for that question. But sometimes, as Judy indicated, we do need to bring, um, 
bring a whole precinct back in to do retabulation. It's our goal to make sure every vote gets counted and is accounted for. And, um, and a retabulation is well within our uh, duties. We can, we can have them come in and just recreate election night and make sure everything is in place. So um, things that might count, uh, cause a recount and if would say that your precinct isn't recountable would be, be if a seal is not placed on the approved ballot container. Um, we, can't, we can't verify the custody of those ballots and in that case, the election night results would stand and we would not retabulate. Um, if the seal number that's on the ballot, actually on the ballot container does not match the number recorded in the poll book, then we can't do anything with that either. And if one of the first things that you wanna do in a recount is count the number of ballots that you have and if, that doesn't match the number of voters, you can't proceed any further. So, um, so we look down a lot of paths to figure, we're, we're like detectives, aren't we, Judy? We're, we're forensic <laughs> detectives. Yes, and so we have a lot of um, remedies that we use and uh, side streets that we go down. We look at uh, spoiled ballots, um, duplicated ballots, provisional ballots. We read every remark that is noted in the poll book. Um, we hear remarks like, you know, so-and-so left to go get a hamburger. One of the po poll workers left to go get a hamburger and returned. And, you know, it runs the gamut from that to a voter got disgruntled, tore up his ballot and walked out, you know. So we, we read them all. And we also review this uh, totals tape multiple times. So um, I think that's about it. I, oh, I wanted to do this quickly. I, I wanted to do the certification. When we are assured that our results are wonderful and valid and accurate, then we pro actually process the uh, certifications and we forward all of our information um, to the Secretary of State in, for the statewide questions. And then we send um, books to the municipalities so that we know who your board of trustees you know, is going to be or who your mayor is going to be or whatever. So, um, so we handle all of those certifications. Um, and then we take everything and we seal it all back up, <laughs> another seal, and, uh, and put it away for storage, safekeeping, right? right? Right. And we want you to know that, um, that we are huge fans of uh, the precinct workers. They put in, they've put in quite a day and do quite a job and have a lot to keep track of, but they do a beautiful job. And uh, we're big fans of our local clerks too, because our job is built on the backs of all of these people that have come before us and done their job. So, so we want to uh, give a shout out to them, yeah. right? Absolutely. All right. Love our local clerks. Right. Exactly. And once, you know, once the um, board of canvassers have done their job and done all this certification and double checked and triple checked all of the results that they have. We also are um, after we do post election audits. So at the county clerk and the secretary of state are, um, uh, we are selected so many precincts um, out of a particular election and we actually go out and do a post election audit. And we actually open these containers and take out all the ballots and count them to make sure that they match and we actually hand count the, a particular race to ensure that the numbers that the totals match, match the actual physical ballots. So we do this for multiple precincts on a post-election audit. Um, 
resources we talked about. Um, um, we're running a little bit over on time. I was going to try to show you our website a little bit, but this is some links here. Um, on our Livingston uh, County website, um, livegov.com slash elections, um, or if you go right to uh, government up here and you go to county clerk, you'll see elections. There is all sorts of information that we have here on our website. And we strive so hard to keep that updated um, and, and with current information. So if you're looking for something, a lot of time it's gonna be right there on our website. Um, and with that, Ellen, um, I think that we are done. We um, could take some questions um, if you want. I will, uh, here's our contact information. Our county clerk, Elizabeth Hundley, um, wasn't able to be with us this evening. I apologize for that. Um, believe it or not, she actually got a vacation. Um, <laughs> you know, and so um, we are, um, she is very sad that she was not able to be here tonight, but uh, she would have if she was not uh, enjoying herself somewhere on vacation. Uh, and it is well-deserved, by the way. Um, yes. So I will go ahead and stop sharing and we can answer questions if that's what you, is that good, Ellen, or? Absolutely, Joe. And by the way, you did a fantastic job, as always, filling in um, for uh, Elizabeth Hundley. So uh, the elections in uh, Livings Livingston County was well covered. I'm gonna ask uh, Brandy, you have questions maybe that were submitted that they could get to real quick? Well, there was the one that was submitted ahead of time that Joe covered about whether um, when voter roles are updated and if de deceased citizens are purged. So thank you for covering that in your presentation, Joe. Um, there, um, I did have one that I saw on for the election results receipt. There were undervotes and overvotes listed, and I wasn't sure what those were. Can you talk about those a bit, Joe? Sure. Um, undervotes are um, simply that someone was supposed to vote for four. Um, primary, the best reason, the best way to describe it is like for trustees. Typically, our townships have like four trustees that you elect. Um, in a given uh, uh, precinct. So if somebody decides, well, I don't know these four people, but I know two out of the four. So two people get a vote, but they've undervoted the other two. So that's what an undervote would be. And unfortunately, an overvote would be if they had like six people that were running on that ballot and they only could vote for four and they voted for five. So they overvoted. The machine's not smart enough to determine which four are they supposed to cast a ballot, ballot for? So they then lose that particular race. They don't, are not the candidate obviously, but that vote does not count because the, the tabulator doesn't know which four that they should have, or they wanted to vote for. However, if that's done in the precinct, uh, it, the tabulator will prompt you or the, uh, the voter prompt you to, that that uh, that was overvoted, and if you'd like to redo your ballot, or it or cast that ballot as is, so they always, they have the option to fix that error. Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much for covering that. Um, every anyone who's on here, uh, you can unmute or you can share and slash or share your video or put a question in chat. There have been no other questions so far. So it's open. Right. It's always a good sign. I, covered a lot of good information. I think you covered it so well. I was, um, I'm just so pleased with the information that we're going to have recorded and up on our YouTube channel along with, in our website, along with the libraries, because this is such valuable information. If you don't mind, we'd like to let our local high school civics teachers know of this recording. I would think it'd be just be a nice addition to their civics instructions on the voting process here in Livingston County. So if you have no problem with that, I'll just make sure that they're aware that it's there. Uh, I wanna thank you so much oh. for um, coming tonight. Oh, go ahead, Tara. Yes, um, Brandy. we just got one question in the chat. 
From Deb, what happens if someone mails in more than one application for an absentee ballot, maybe one from the township or city and another from some other group, as you mentioned during your presentation, Joe? What would happen then? Um, at that point in time, um, it depends. Um, we've already received the first application and potentially have already, um, or that has already been put into the system as being received. Um, and at that point in time, we receive a second application. Um, most of our clerks will just file that with the other application um, and yep. you will just get your ballot mailed out to you. We, in, in, in the city of Brighton, um, that happens quite a bit, especially during those larger elections uh, with the multiple mailings to different, to, to residents. So what I always do, um, you know, well, I'll check it in. Oh, this is a duplication, a duplicate, make sure all of the information is the same and just write dupe on it and put it, put it in a folder until the end of the election and then store it away. So we do keep those um, just for rec record purposes and just in case. But yep, we just compare the information and then write dupe on it and put it in a folder. And it happens regularly. Well, I, I think that may be the end of the questions. Janice did want to say, nice to know our elections are so secure. Thank you for taking the time to make this very informative presentation. Well, we appreciate you uh, inviting us out here and uh, uh, Judy and Carla. Carla's got to get over here and show her face. Just but, uh, you know, um, we all got together in the one location, so it was just a little quicker for everybody to, to present. So we really appreciate the league uh, taking the time out to uh, make sure that, you know, the information, the right information is getting out there. And that's the key is the right information is getting there. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. And the league's mission is to educate voters. And if this doesn't... Uh, fit that tonight. I don't know. I, I give up. This has just been phenomenal. <laughs> and I encourage anyone, as as Carla and Judy said, to come witness uh, the Board of Canvassers. And it's five long days. It, 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 I just recall sitting there at the, the November election of uh, 2020. And I walked away knowing that our election results were accurate and there was such integrity and professionalism that was witnessed during that time. I can't say enough on how sure I am. Our elections are in great hands with all the election officials that we have here in our county. So thank you so much. Um, and again, come out and be an election inspector. If, if anybody out there is watching this now or at some other point in the future, um, come see what it's all about. And I just noticed that all those signatures, you didn't refer to them, but as an election inspector in Brighton, I've had to sign and sign and sign that saying <laughs> what I did was accurate. And I noticed all those signatures. And when you finish the board of canvassers, they sign multiple documents that saying this is accurate. And we put our name on it. So thank you for, for the work you do and um, for ensuring the integrity of our elections here in Livingston County and for joining us tonight. Well, thank, thank you so you much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, th thank you, Ellen. Thank you so much, Joe and Carla, Judy and Tara for sharing uh, your knowledge and expertise with us this evening for and for your public service, really. Um, thanks again to our partner, the League of Women Voters of Livingston County for making this evening possible. Visit their website, www.lwvlivingstonco.org to learn more about the organization and how you can become involved. Thank you for attending tonight's program. We hope you enjoyed it. If you could take a few minutes, there's a, um, a short evaluation linked in the chat. Tell us what you thought of this. Everyone who registered today, as Ellen had said at the top of the hour, um, will soon receive an email, including links to all the resources that were mentioned during the presentation, including the presentation slides so you can review them. Um, and we will share this recording on YouTube so you can use them side by side. Um, visit our website, www.howellibrary.org to discover more upcoming events from the Howell Carnegie District Library. Thank you and good night, everyone. Good night.